questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. No, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that so much of the standing and session orders be suspended, as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition moving. Order, order. The House will come to order. Order. It's your option to have question time. No problem. The I lead, move that so the much. Leader of the Opposition is moving. I, is the Leader of the Opposition moving a suspension? I move that so much of the standing and session orders be suspended as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition moving forthwith the following motion. That this House censures the Prime Minister for delisted, deliberately misleading this House on the effect of the Coalition's fight back package. Good. I move. I move that this. I move that this House censures the Prime Minister for deliberately misleading the House on the effect of the Coalition's fight back package. Order. Order. The order. Okay. Yesterday, the House will come to order. I might begin by order. saying the, the leader of the opposition might remove, resume his seat for a moment. The question is that standing orders be suspended. All those of that opinion, please say aye. aye. Is the motion seconded? Uh, yes. I'll take it as yes. seconded by the member for uh, for Flinders. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion, please say aye. aye. Those against no, I think the ayes have it. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. You got it wrong. Thank you, thank you Mr Speaker. Thank you, to now, thank now you Mr Speaker. Motion. I might begin my... I just moved it. No, no we, hadn't sus we hadn't suspended standing order. OK, I move. I move. Order. Order. The House will come to order. Members on my right. I move that this House censures the Prime Minister for deliberately misleading the House on the effect of the Coalition's fight back package. And might I begin by saying, Mr Speaker, that as we've just seen the handkerchief passed across the table as it was yesterday, that, this, that the leopard never changes its spots. He sticks to the old ideas and the old arguments. Nothing new out of this man in the last nine years. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker yes. And might I also point Order. out that it is a white handkerchief today, which I take to be surrender, because yesterday, yesterday it was a blue handkerchief. Okay. Yesterday we support. Yesterday we sought to show that this prime minister cannot be believed; that he has zero credibility when it when it comes to matters of, of economic management, and economic policy. He has deliberately and knowingly misrepresented our economic circumstances over his entire period in government. And yesterday we gave you dozens of examples of how he'd misrepresented the state of the, the economy, whether or not there'd be a recession, the nature of the recovery and the successes, in quotes, of his so-called economic management. And if our questions didn't clearly establish that point yesterday, his answers certainly did. <laughs> Because, again, he failed to, uh, to live up to the pledge that he made the day he became Prime Minister. And just to remind the Prime Minister what he said at that time, the day he became Prime Minister, he put down three pledges, and the second pledge was to deal honestly with the people, to tell them the truth. In, and he went on to say, in tough times, of course, the temptation is always to gild the lily. And he said, I will be resisting that temptation as much as is humanly possible. I'll speak honestly with them, to them and realistically. And in the first opportunity that this Prime Minister has had to do precisely that and to honour that pledge, which was yesterday in this parliament in question time, he fell over at that hurdle. He failed to live up to the pledge to tell the truth. And in fact, he deliberately and knowingly misrepresented the work of a respected academic economist and now business economist, an ex-Treasury officer whose work has been fundamental to the development of modelling in Treasury as part from a number of other places. He deliberately and knowingly misrepresented that uh, person's views. It was a day, of course, where the Prime Minister was under a lot of pressure. He had to prove that he could really do it, that he really still had it. He, could, he was worried about the image that would be created up here in the gallery. Was he still the same tough old performer? So, as is typical of this person, he will, as is characteristic of his career, he will say anything or do anything. He will lie. He will cheat. He will misrepresent. He will do anything. He will do anything. Say anything. 
order. He will deal with anybody. Order, order, he will deal order. With the anybody. leader of the opposition will re will withdraw the remark about lying. That's a censure motion. It's a censure motion. <coughs> Motion. You, you, you can't, uh, even in a censure motion, one doesn't make that point. Well, might I use the word grossly misrepresent, and just deliberately misrepresent, and knowingly misrepresent? He will deliberately misrepresent anything, do anything, say anything, deal with anybody to maintain and save his political skin. And that is characteristic by the way he treated, of the way he treated the Murphy analysis yesterday. Now, let's have a look. Let's have a look at what he actually said in those answers to the questions yesterday and how he deliberately and knowingly misrepresented the circumstances. And there are about 20 odd misrepresentations in the context of his answers yesterday, but let me just pick the three big ones. Let me just pick the three big ones. The first one, the first one, am I allowed to say a big lie? The, the, the biggest lie. Order, order. The leader of the opposition knows the rules about using that word, and he won't use it. The boldest misrepresentation of all was the statement that our package will actually make the economy smaller. And I asked, I asked the prime minister, who believes that? Nobody in Treasury believes that. Murphy certainly doesn't believe that, and certainly did not say that. And uh, I asked him, who? says that our package will make the economy smaller. A, a total and deliberate misrepresentation of the facts. He also went on to say that Murphy was the economist who had simulated our package. He was the econometrician who had put our package together. A rather novel claim, given that Murphy joined Access Economics a few weeks before the fight back package was delivered. And he had only done a technical piece of analysis which is included as an appendix. He did not design the fight back package. He did not design the fight back package and he didn't model. Order. He did not model in the noise. paper that was referred to, he did not Order. model. He did Order. not model the package as it was and, and the Prime Minister knows this. The Prime Minister knows he didn't model the package. He modelled just a part of the package, a small part of the package. He only modelled a switch from from a goods, to a goods and services tax and, uh, and the uh, proceeds being spent on income tax, he did not model the wholesale sales tax abolition, he did not model the payroll tax abolition, he did not model the petrol excise abolition, he did not model the 20 to 50 per cent reduction in costs and improvements in efficiency that will come from our infrastructure reform package, he did not model the industrial relations reform, he did not model the cuts in immigration, he did not model any of those things in that package that you have referred to. So he did not model the package. He did a technical academic exercise, as he has said. Thirdly, of course, the economists, uh, I, I'm, I'm fascinated at some of the statements that the Treasurer made. For example, he must have known that Murphy's results, he must have known that Murphy's results did not show a 4% reduction in GDP as he claimed. He must know that. He must know that. Yes, but you can't read the table, can you? Because what Murphy actually shows is that there are uh, changes in, uh, in GDP between minus 0.4 and plus 0.3, not 4 per cent, over, over the period that he modelled. He showed, he showed, and this should be made clear, infinitesimal deviations off a trend and a long-term gain arising from a small part of the package. A deliberate misrepresentation of order. the facts has the been embodied in that order. paper and has been made clear by the author of that paper himself subsequently. So the Prime Minister deliberately and knowingly misrepresented the circumstances here in the, in, in the, uh, in the parliament yesterday. Even in respect of his own recession, he got the numbers wrong. He claimed, for example, that uh, the recession only cost 3 per cent in GDP, which was less than the claim he said would flow from the fight back package, which has been proved to be wrong. The overall cost of the recession so far is 7 per cent, and I say so far. So far, the overall cost is 7 per cent. He claims three on his own recession. He deliberately and knowingly understated the effect of that change. It's not just how much GDP falls, Order. but Members how on much my it left otherwise would have risen in the course of the, of the period that's being modelled. Now, where does he quote? What, what does he use? What did he use as his source? What did he use as his source for this analysis? He didn't, as you might have noticed yesterday, hold up the... Uh, the uh, um, the uh, Murphy paper. He didn't Order. hold up the Murphy paper. 
he held up a couple of articles from a newspaper that were dated last Friday. Harcher articles in particular from the Sydney Morning Herald. And doesn't that beg the question where Harcher got the story from? Hey? Do you reckon do you reckon Harcher's got do you reckon Harcher's got the capacity to have think, thought of this himself? It begs the question, doesn't it, as to whether the story was given to him. Whether the story was given to him. So that he so given, the story was given to him so that they could base their attack on it this week. And he did the didn't. House will come to And order. the Prime Minister did not. The Prime Minister order. knew far too yesterday much noise. that he was misrepresenting that situation because last Friday, after the publication of these articles, Murphy went on to a Sydney radio program, Alan Jones, and denied the accuracy <laughs> of those claims. And yet they they were they were there. They were there and claimed to be so. And doesn't this beg the question? Doesn't this beg the question whether this isn't going to be a pattern with this government? It begs the question whether this treasurer, sorry, this prime minister, whether there, there isn't a pattern to what he's doing to leak a story, to push a story at the start of a week, to run that story through the parliament. Order. The member for begs, Lowe and the member for Dawson will cease interjecting. As, as, as it begs the question. Trying, I'm trying with great difficulty to hear the Leader of the Opposition, and I can't with his colleagues interjecting. Members on both sides will cease interjecting, and the Leader of the Opposition should be heard in silence. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Just as it begs the question as to whether Harcher was fed that story as a basis for the political attack this week, it begs the question as to whether next week's Four Corners program Minister is going to be used transport. as the basis for the same sort of attack next week. And when we find that the when we find that the author, one of the principal architects of that program, is a mate of the Prime Minister's press secretary, you start to wonder. You start to wonder whether this isn't isn't going to be a pattern. So it begs the question whether we aren't seeing a pattern where they ignore the facts, where they ignore Order. the truth, where they ignore what's said, and they just get on and manufacture circumstances in which they can run in the course of the following week. So I ask the Treasurer against that background that if he's going to draw on the resources of his staff that way, and presumably they were the ones who made these miscalculations that, he, that, uh, that were referred to yesterday on his own, impact, his, recession, his, his own recession's impact on GDP. I ask him why he didn't look at the work of one of his other advisers, his principal economic adviser, John Edwards, who has actually assessed the fight back package and who has actually made some very important statements about the substance of the fight back package. For example, he said, it is certainly the boldest and most detailed proposal to change the federal budget for a very long time. <laughs> Secondly, he said, I don't think it is worth arguing. I like this, do you? One of yours being quoted back at you. <laughs> you, don't, you don't like it. Secondly, <coughs> Order. Secondly, he said, I don't think it's worth arguing that a goods and services tax will cause inflation. As distinct from a one-time increase in the price level or recession, it might, but in reasonable circumstances it might not. It will not, I'm sorry. And at the worst, uh, he talks about the, the issue of payroll tax. At the worst, the substitution of a goods and services tax for Remember payroll for tax will do no harm and may actually do a lot of good. Another comment on the package is that its strength is the fact, its strength is the fact that the plan proposes to eliminate payroll tax which is a very good idea indeed, and that both the compensation package and the income tax cuts proposed appear to be reasonably fair. So on most aspects of the package, your own principal economic adviser has actually given us a clean bill of health and says it's worth doing. And, and on the particular element that he, that he focused on in some of those quotes, payroll tax represents a very important challenge to you. You're bringing down a statement tonight that's designed to create jobs. You yourself said back in 1977 that the abolition of payroll tax at that time would create 200,000 jobs. Let's have a look at how many jobs you create tonight and whether you've got the courage of your convictions to actually deliver a substantial change in payroll tax that would, that would bring about those, um, those sort of results. <coughs> so we now know that um, the, the, the uh, Prime Minister has deliberately and knowingly misrepresented the, uh, the work of Dr Murphy, and Dr Murphy has responded by describing the Prime Minister's parliamentary performance as false, 
inaccurate, a significant misrepresentation, heavily distorted, and he got it wrong. So if you don't want to believe me, you can believe the author of the paper who actually has made those comments about you. Order. Now, of course, uh, the central issue here, and the issue to, there are two central issues to this to this censure motion. One is, of course, to pose a direct and deliberate question to the Prime Minister: Did he deliberately misrepresent a respected academic's research to suit his own political ends? And if he did, if he did, is he man enough to say that he did? Is he man enough to say that he was wrong? Is he man enough to apologise to the academic economist concerned? And secondly, the broader issue about whether this Prime Minister can be believed in anything he says. Can this Prime Minister be believed in anything he says? That is a significant issue that should be an essential background to tonight's economic statement. Because this statement is supposed to bring a fresh start for this country, as we've seen so many fresh starts before from this Prime Minister. Let's just go back and run over a few of the claims that this man has made in the past about his economic management. Back in 87, we won't go all the way, but we'll just start a few years ago. Back in 87, he said, tonight, in the May statement, tonight he said, I can report that Australia is winning. Back in 87 in the May statement. In September 87, following the budget of that year, he said, and you want to wait and focus on this one because this one is worth bottling. This is the one where he said, this is the great coming of age of Australia. This is the golden age of economic change. I'm sure the one million unemployed are going to be delighted to hear that. The golden age. Remember that one. And then in 1988, 1988, he was getting carried away with his rhetoric, which, as you know, is not characteristic of this man. Hey, what? He said, in terms of the budget, this is the one which brings home the bacon. But is that, that, that wasn't anywhere near as far as he went on that occasion. I know that one's had a lot of, a lot of uh, publicity, but he actually said quite a lot more. He said, without a doubt, the crowning glory of anything the Australian Treasury and any government have ever produced. <laughs> A modest understatement, of course. Then again, in 89, as the circumstances were running against him, he said, Australia will, will emerge <coughs> from the recent high level of spending without a recession and with its economic and social structure improving. Now, I'd like him to go down to some of the unemployment lines in Coburg and ask them whether they think the social structure is improving and how deep the recession has actually gone. And then, of course, in August 1990, he capped it all when he said, there are <coughs> these are definitely the golden years of change. Of course, they are the golden years of change. <laughs> Everyone was getting a bit worried by 1990 that, in fact, what he'd been saying for several years wasn't actually happening, but he, he kept reassuring everyone. And remember all those other statements? There will be no recession. Uh, there didn't need to be any recession. Won't you know, there recession. won't let there be a recession. Uh, we're under, the the economy is recovering. There's a whole string of these on the economy recovering from late 89 or early 90 right through 91. Always the economy is just Order. about to recover. And I'm sure tonight we'll hear again that the economy is just about to recover. Oh. You know, it's been just about to recover under this bloke for a couple of years as, as it presently stands. So two questions to the Prime Minister. Is he man enough to admit he was wrong, to admit that he deliberately misrepresented the facts? Is he man enough then to apologise no. to Dr Murphy? And secondly, what is he going to do tonight to set aside nine years of gross misrepresentation and distortion, a characteristic of which we saw yesterday on his first attempt in this parliament? He doesn't worry about facts. They get in the way of his political career. He abuses them, twists them, contorts them, does whatever he wants to do in order to turn our circumstances around. The real issue, the real issue, his circumstances around, sorry, the real issue tonight is whether this man can face our problems and can deliver, can deliver the economic package that, that this country needs. We will scrutinise this package from two points of view. One, in economic terms, we'll start off to see whether, in fact, this is an attempt 
to be more honest about our economic circumstances? Will he admit, as Access Economics have estimated and others are now confirming, that our, balance of, our budget deficit this year is blowing out? Access have said it could be as high as $9 billion, and when you exclude the asset sales, as high as $12 billion. And will, he be, will he be prepared to admit that? Will he be prepared to go with genuine labour market reform? Will he be prepared to go with genuine infrastructure reform? We've talked about micro-reform. He's talked about micro-reform for years. He's actually claimed there was nothing more to reform. And the only people who, who actually Order. talked about micro-reform were the Galahs in the pet shop. Remember those statements? Yeah. He'd done it all years ago. It'd be interesting to see whether he comes back tonight and admits he hasn't done it all and that there's quite a lot to be done in terms of infrastructure reform. And of course, will he, will he be prepared to face the issue of tax reform? Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the interesting and I think most telling points against this man and his attack on us, our package and the GST, is that he was indeed the strongest advocate of this package back in 1985. And I'll just remind you what he said in 1985. He said this would result in a manifestly fairer tax system, would create the foundations for a more efficient system to promote stronger economic growth and higher living standards. This was this man in 1985 when he was advocating tax reform, when he was advocating a broad-based goods and services tax. Yet now, when it suits his attempt to save his political hide, he distorts and misrepresents and takes the opposite side of an issue that he, he apparently claimed that he believed in, he says he believed in, 1985. Secondly, tonight we will assess his Order. package as a kickback package. We will look for the extent of the kickbacks, the political deals that have been done with Joan Kerner, John Bannon, Order. Wally Curran, the ACTU, and all Order. those the leader of the on the other side. time has expired. Is the motion seconded? The motion is seconded by the honourable member for Flinders. Does he wish to speak? The honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Order. Mr. Speaker. You see, the House will come to order. One always needs a little bit of luck in public life. Always a little bit of luck. <laughs> and the day after a dream run from the media, with the first little bit of pressure on his consumption tax, first little bit of pressure on the Houston GST, he cracks, he cracks the member for like an egg. And the gallery is two thirds empty and not witnessing it. Now, that's what I mean. That is a time when most of the journos who have taken this drivel that's been dredged up to them over time, this sort of great fat document. And when they finally see a little bit of pressure, what do we see? A petulant, panic-stricken, brittle performance. Brittle, brittle performance. Well, if, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, if the words liar, cheat, big liar, distorter, misrepresenter isn't petulant, what is? What is? What is? What is? I mean, I mean, Order. how robust? How Order. Oh, oh, sit down. Come in. The words he's used. You insist the Prime Minister of Opposition uh, withdraw that uh, phraseology. You should apply the same rule to the Prime Minister. Order. The, the leader of the opposition, the leader of the opposition, said in his comments, which he was asked to withdraw, that the Prime Minister said uh, was. And order. Order. I warn the honourable member for Dundas, and uh, the, 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 there are entirely different circumstances. The honourable prime minister, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, he made these claims and then withdrew them, as you requested, but then made others. The fact is that, with one criticism yesterday of the central tenant of the fight back GST package, which goes right to the heart of it, he couldn't tolerate the criticism. He couldn't tolerate the criticism has suspended the question time period to move a, a, a proposition which says that, I, that the price should be censured for deliberately misrepresenting, <laughs> deliberately misrepresenting his, his package and then in the most petulant, britty, uh, brittle and glass-jaw manner, glass manner hops into me for being a liar, a cheat and uh, a misrepresenter and distorter. Then he says he blames the story written in the Sydney Morning Herald on my press secretary, who had nothing whatsoever to do with it, nothing whatsoever. He impugns Mr. Harcher. He impugned, and it wouldn't matter if he did. The fact is, the Sydney Morning Herald and now the ABC are part of the witch hunt. He's witch hunting on the ABC, 
and the Sydney Morning Herald for the, the ABC for next week's Four Corners. They're going to be shocking and terrible too, and maybe ask a question about the GST. Two and a half months, two and a half months of easy riding is not enough for him. But how dare the ABC actually ask about something that's going to put 15 per cent on every person's food, clothing and services in the country? How dare the ABC? But the fact is, but, but the fact is this. But the fact is this, Mr. Speaker. This, this package was to bring Australia out of a recession, into a recovery, and to lift if the income. If the member for Mayo interjects again, GDP, I will name it. I warn the member for Mayo. You resume your seat. You have a point of order. Mr Speaker, uh, in the interests of, uh, which I know you strongly believe, in equity and certainly consistent with the standing orders, I think when a minister the should interject member for Mayo and make comments across the table to me, if I respond, I accept that uh, by interjecting, I accept that by interjecting that may be contrary to the standing the orders. For Mayo, the member so for Mayo the will resume his seat. The member for Mayo is a consistent and persistent interjector, and if he interjects again, I will name him. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the whole point of Fight Back and the GST was to lift, was to lift incomes, to, to take Australia from a recession to a recovery, to lift incomes and employment. And what Dr Murphy's work shows, and he was engaged to look at the shift from income tax to consumption. And Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I have the uh, output of, of Dr Murphy's Minister work here. I actually, I actually have. The printout. I actually have the printout of Dr. Murphy's work, and it says a shift from income tax to consumption tax. And if he looks at the 20, the 20 quarter that modelling, that's the five year modelling, under any scenario, real GDP goes down and unemployment goes up. Oh. Under any scenario, <laughs> on the base case, real GDP declines by 0.2%. On, on the wages up case, as it's called, that is where they can't keep the GST out of wages, it declines by 4 per cent, as I said yesterday. And on unemployment, unemployment rises by 0.2 under the best case and by 2 per cent under the worst case. So the whole GST fight back proposition, modelled on a shift from income tax to consumption, will actually increase GD, will decrease GDP and will increase unemployment. Now, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, that I mean can you imagine? Mr Speaker, can you imagine? The House of Speaker Can you imagine members on my left anybody proposing a censure motion the Deputy Leader of the Opposition will cease interjecting. Anyone proposing a censure motion now you're not allowed to argue up order. There's a leader of the opposition does the Leader of the Opposition have a point of order? The Prime, well, the Prime Minister is referring to a table. I just want to make sure we've got the right table. Is that the right table? Order. It says deviation from the baseline. Opposition, the the deviation of the Opposition will resume his seat. Prime Shambles. Order. Your package, Mr Speaker. GST is a, an economic shambles. Order. The House will come GST to order. is a sham and a shambles. That's what this shows. A sham and a shambles. Mr Speaker, the modeller of the shift from income to, to a consumption damn, says GDP goes down and unemployment comes up. There is the work. And if you want more than that, I'll quote Dr Murphy on PM, where he says the actual shift. What about unemployment on, on, on Alan Jones? What about uh, unemployment, Mr Murphy? The actual shift in the tax mix from an increase in indirect taxes financed by a cut in income taxes, that actual part of the opposition's package wouldn't have much effect on unemployment one way or the other. The results I am presenting show a very marginal increase over five years. A marginal increase in unemployment over five years. I mean, what's the point of the package? I mean, if unemployment actually goes up over five years, if unemployment goes up over five years, what is the point of the package? Now I'm a simple person. I'll listen for the answer, but I've never heard a se an answer. So he says. So the fact Order. is, under the GST switch, under the GST switch, GDP and unemployment suffer. So says your econometric modeller. 
There's the printout of his work. Don't blackguard Harcher or the ABC or my press secretary. There's your work. It's not worth a bean. Not worth a bean. It's a fancy you after, after we doubled GDP in the 1980s from your miserable 1.8 per cent a year to 4.2. After all that, took GDP from 171 to 405 billion, and you bring in a package which will attack the way of life of every Australian person and family, which will add, put 15 per cent on everything they put in their mouth and on their back, every service they undertake, which will, which will and as, 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 as Dr Murphy says, could inflation increase? He was asked, it could. It would certainly increase in the year of introduction of the GST. And yesterday at the seminar there was another major paper about why it would not be why the surge in prices could not be locked out of wages. Why the surge could not be locked out of wages and why it would go into ongoing inflation. So not only do you reduce GDP and you increase unemployment, you actually massively increase inflation and you would know nothing, do nothing about it and could do nothing about it. And that's why in 1985, when we looked at a consumption tax, I said if we can't get the wage discounts, we won't vandalise the economy. And we couldn't and we didn't. But you can't get the wage discounts, but you want to press ahead. You want to press ahead with a surge in inflation. You, on your own admission, will double the inflation rate. On the figures in your own fight back package, you're going to double the inflation rate. And I dare get up and say, I mean, isn't it shocking of me to actually say, this, uh, this academic's work says the GDP goes down and unemployment goes up, and old Glassjaw here is in here with a censure motion. Yeah, the Prime Minister will refer to <laughs> Not a question. A censure motion. A censure well, motion. Mr. Speaker, Come on, you're unbelievable. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Hume, on a point of I ask that you require the Prime Minister to withdraw that derogatory remark against the Order. Order. I ask, I ask the Prime Minister to refer to. Order. I ask the Prime Minister to refer to members by their title, and I'd ask all members to refer to each other by their title. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, you see, see for, Order. Mate, the GST, Mr. Speaker, was Order. well and there good. There is no necessity for a withdrawal. The Mr. Prime Speaker, Minister. the GST was well and good until someone asked the first primary basic question about it. Did it actually improve the economy? Would it be better for unemployment? Would it create jobs? Would it lift GDP? Or would it hold inflation down? And the answer to all that is it will, it will decrease GDP, it will increase unemployment and it will increase inflation. So says your econometrician. So says your econometrician. So, I mean, here we are. We're going to have this thing which puts the Australian way of life at risk for every low-income family, for every low-income family, Order. And the moment the, house will come the moment the moment the prime minister of this country dare says, well, I don't think this is a this is a, a worthy set of objectives. What do we have? A censure motion, a censure, motion. and then being called a liar, a cheat, a big liar, a distorter, a misrepresenter. I mean, what we I said I said I mean two out of two on last Sunday. I said that. As I come after you, you'll get nastier and nastier. You got nastier yesterday, and you're nasty again today. You're nasty again today with the vicious, the vicious slurs about liars and cheats. You can't take it. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, you can't take it, but you can give it. Order. You want to put this monkey on the back of every Australian worker and taxpayer, and you want them to repent in their leisure as you sit up with the most, with the most economy-busting measure. In Japan, they brought in a 3 per cent consumption tax, and there's been almost a social revolution over it. Just imagine what 15 is like. Order. The Can member you for Mitchell will withdraw that the remark. the dislocation of a 15 per cent? The member, the member for Mitchell will withdraw that remark. The member for Mitchell will withdraw the remark. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, and as well as that, he said I'd misrepresented so many positions. Look, I, look, I won't bother the House, but like a quote like this, double-digit inflation will arise at the end of the Hawke-Keating government on the 21st of February 1990. Double-digit inflation is now 1.6. <laughs> Not 10, 1.6. 1.6. The government up, government's given up, given up inflation. Well, there's the quote. There's the quote. I think I can read. D is for double. O is... Oh, you double-digit inflation, double-digit, 
the government given up on inflation control, and, uh, and there's more and more of these extravagant, of course, claims by the Leader of the Opposition. The fact is, Mr Speaker, I t the, the Leader of the Opposition didn't engage a policy which was better for Australia. The GST and fight back was not designed to be better because Australia needed a better policy. It was designed principally to make the Leader of the Opposition look different, different from the government. That's all. The only basis, the motivation for fight back was he didn't say, look, what does this country need? What does this country need? He said, now, look, I've been, I've been in the job for three months. I somehow have got to look different. What can I do they're not doing? What can I do that makes me look different? Maybe I could take on the GST, the consumption tax. That's what motivated him. Not any decent public purpose, but to look after your own miserable political hide. That's where fight back came from. And then you turned it over to a stack of private accountants to work out of it. And then, Mr. Speaker, Order. then, Mr. Speaker, Order. on top of that, then on top of that, we actually get some focus by the academics. And what do the academics say in a conference? You won't lock, lock the surge increase out of wages. You will vandalise the national inflation rate. And even from the person who has most regard from you, that is the person to whom you, you are his client, Dr. Murphy, he says that under any scenario, the base case. Minus two per cent, the wages, case, wages up case minus four, on unemployment up 0.2, and under the wages up case plus two per cent rise in unemployment. So, how could you ever have the gall to look anybody in the eye and suggest fight back as a, as a panacea for Australia's problems of uh, growth, employment, jobs, inflation, and of recovery, of course, with all the rest thrown in investment, the current account, and the rest? Fight back, Mr. Speaker, is an economic sham. This, 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 this computer printout, this model, proves it. And the Leader of the Opposition, in proposing a censure, just shows how sensitive, brittle, and unprepared he is for the kind of political discussions that the fight back program necessarily brings. Order. Order. The Honourable the the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Now the House will come to order. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you know it's amazing. You are hopeless. It is amazing. This man still hasn't got the point. You know, after well, after four days, the penny is still to drop on the world's greatest treasurer. Did you hear him? The package is going to reduce, contract the size of the economy. Murphy didn't say that, never said anything like it. And yet this mug, with all the Treasury advice, with all the economists from PM and C, he still doesn't have the point. I mean, maybe we got it wrong. We said that he deliberately, he deliberately misrepresented the situation. Well, I mean, after that performance, he still doesn't have the point. Now listen, listen, Prime Minister. Here's, here's, the, here's the table. Here's the table. It's not a hard thing to do, but you go to the top left-hand corner, read the first line, and when you've done that, then you'll get the point. Read the second line. Deviations from the baseline. Now, now, Prime Minister, read the second line, mate. You've got to get the point. Murphy didn't say GDP was going to reduce under the coalition's package. He was talking about deviations from a baseline. And the second point, which the Prime Minister still fails to grasp, and that's a very simple point, and that is that Murphy did not attempt to simulate the whole of fight back. I mean, all this debate, as the Prime Minister sees it, is about the totality of what we're doing. You know, unemployment's going up, inflation's going up, interest rates are going up, the economy's going to contract, all hell will break loose if you vote for the coalition. Murphy didn't simulate the totality of the package. And in fact, when Murphy went on air this morning and issued his press release last night, he just did one stroke completely demolished this man, this great pretender, this arrogant, abrasive, insulting Prime Minister, in one foul stroke. The truth of the matter is Murphy looked at one small part, one small part of the package, and he came up with some results on a very technical basis 
against a deviation line. And if you ask Murphy what's the bottom line, even if you look at the little bit that the Prime Minister is so excited about, the bottom line is that it's good news for the economy. It's a benefit over time. You can look at the deviations. I mean, he reckons our package is of tenth order significance. You know, a classic prime ministerial statement. He, of course, was one of the keenest advocates of this sort of change years ago. He came up with a figure of 4 per cent, but of course the Murphy figure was actually 0.04 per cent. He was, I mean, you know, we're in the worst recession in 60 years, and this bloke is out by a multiplier of 10. No wonder we've got a prediction that the budget deficit is heading towards 9 billion, and he's still on 5 billion. I mean, it is incredible. And the only grace I can provide to the Prime Minister is that he doesn't even understand the significance of what ought to be a very simple point. Look, there's no pressure on us. I mean, wasn't it a classic line? You know, he starts and says, oh, this opposition, it's on the back foot. The classic Keating line, he's on the back foot. The best form of defence is offence. Well, very offensive he is. Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, we went through yesterday the Prime Minister's answer to this question that was put to him in respect of the Murphy modelling and to analyse what he in fact was saying about the Murphy model in the closest possible way. And, uh, and I will make these uh, observations available to those who want to scrutinise them more carefully. But we came up with over 20 clear misrepresentations of the coalition's package. From start to finish, in about 10 minutes, he failed to tell the Australian people the truth about the one set of economic policies that really do provide this country with an alternative vision and a chance that we might finally get out of the recession that this bloke deliberately engineered and has the gall to boast about. And he starts with the headline show. He quotes academics crook on GST. I tell you what, by God, they are. Well, even that's not true. That's not true. Murphy, in fact, reports that the great majority of support at the conference was for the indirect tax reform package, which essentially is what the GST is about. And that's no surprise, because if anybody sits down and looks at the issue objectively, they would come to the same conclusion. He then goes on to say, Murphy, the econometrician who put together the model on which the GST was based and tested. Well, he's a very good bloke, Murphy, but as a matter of fact, he didn't actually uh, receive from us a, a consultancy to base and to, uh, to use his model and to base and test the GST on that. In fact, that work was done by Dr Neil Warren, who's Australia's expert on indirect taxes, which I'm sure uh, Dr Murphy would be happily, happily to, would be happy to acknowledge although I'm sure that uh, Dr Warren can look forward to a bucket and distortions next week following Four Corners. He went on to say, saying in a paper that GDP would be reduced for at least five years as a result of the consumption tax. Simply not true. Unemployment would be higher for at least five years, as I've demonstrated. Simply not true. We find that the econometrician most associated with it says that it will actually reduce GDP. Prime Minister, wrong again. He said the recession has cost us 3 per cent of GDP. Wrong. On Murphy's calculations, nearly 7 per cent of GDP. He said Dr Murphy says the GDP would be reduced by 4 per cent as a result of the Houston consumption tax. Simply wrong. And of course, one of the bases upon which the Prime Minister builds his insubstantial case is to take the worst case scenario that Murphy modelled for the sake of, in his words, logical completeness. An, absol an absolute distortion of what Murphy says, and I'm pleased that Dr Murphy has in fact crushed the Prime Minister on that point. Yeah, yeah. He goes on to say, and I quote again from the Prime Minister's two answers in question time yesterday, in other words, a reduction greater than the impact of the recession on the GDP. Wrong again on two counts. One, because it was 7 per cent on Murphy's calculations, not 3 per cent, and of course his 4 per cent was wrong in the first place. A double score, we ought to call that a double lie. This is the product of the Liberal Party. Well, thank you very much, but let's not forget the strength of the coalition and our National Party colleagues. Another lie. A package which actually makes the economy smaller. Uh, simply not true. 
not the truth, another lie. Number 10. Order, when you look order, at the opposition, the, the deputy leader of the opposition will withdraw that remark. Uh, I withdraw number nine and replace. <laughs> order. Order. I've got over 20. I'm happy to pull back. Order. A couple. The deputy leader of the opposition will withdraw the remark that he made. I withdraw the remark. Number 10. When you look at the opposition's micro policy, you see that it is micro by name and micro by nature. Well, what a ripper that was. $60 billion. That's micro. Well, I suppose if you brought on a recession like this man has, uh, anything would pale into insignificance. <laughs> The econometrician that actually put the vote back model together and tested it wrong, as I've said. There'll be a reduction in GDP as a result of the GST. He really couldn't help himself. Wrong again. Number 13. This is the plan for Australia. A plan to go backwards. For heaven's sakes, he's the one taking us backwards. We're the only ones with a plan to go forwards. Number 14. Inflation has, Australia has an inflation rate of 1.5 per cent. Well, only half of them is truth. Only half of them is truth. That might be the headline rate. But of course, Treasury would tell him if he asked them that Australia's underlying rates close to 3%, and of course, the expectations are that it will go higher. The second lowest by a decimal point in the world, probably right, but again, only half right, simply because that refers to the headline figure. The nation has succeeded in breaking the back of the most pernicious economic disease in a quarter of a century. We have achieved low inflation. So the Prime Minister told Parliament yesterday, well, that ain't right. That is simply not true. We have not broken the back of inflationary expectations in this country. You don't need to be an economist or the Prime Minister to know that. Just go out and talk to ordinary Australians about their expectations for inflation, or look at the bond market, or take some advice from some of his Treasury experts. We have a long way to go in this country if we are to break the back of inflation. And of course, to achieve that, we need some structural reforms about which I'll say in a moment. But this government, on that important issue, has no commitment to the medium term price stability goal of 0.2 per cent that the opposition has uh, properly put in the policy debate. And it just shows you, it just shows you these people claim to have a campaign against inflation, but they are not prepared to publicly target inflation and make the big changes that are necessary to achieve that rate. And he says, and now with a 1.5 per cent inflation rate. Another quote, again, wrong again, as I've explained. When the earth author of the model which produces it, Dr Murphy, has issued this warning about it, referring to the package. Wrong again, not Murphy and not the package. Wrong twice. That, I, that ought to take me to number 20 already. The author of your economic model, wrong again. The opposition have no wage arrangement between themselves. Now, that wasn't a bad one, was it? He just slipped that one in. You know, we've got no wages policy. We've got a wages policy. He attacks it every second day. He's the one who doesn't have a wages policy. He's waiting for the unions to meet on Friday to tell him what his wages policy is. <laughs> that was number 20. 21. If one is on the low end, of course, one gets much less than people on the higher end of the income scale. Well, this is their distribution argument. Oh, this is a favourite Labor Party argument. You know, you vote for the coalition, they'll change the system, and the poor people will be poorer and the rich will be richer. Well, of course, if you look at his last income tax cut, the rich are the ones who got richer and the poor didn't do so well. And secondly, and most importantly, if you look at our tax package, the entirety of Fight Back, one of the great things about it is that we provide the greatest need and the greatest support to those in the greatest need. Yeah. And one of the people who has publicly acknowledged it—I mean, it is ironical, this little debate about uh, the Prime Minister's misrepresentations, because he takes Murphy, who worked for Access, who worked for us, and it uses Murphy to attack us. And yet his own adviser—and he distorts, distorts and, and misrepresents Murphy—and yet his own chief principal economic adviser you know, his top on show in his office has publicly acknowledged the progressiveness of our fight back program. In other words, this man comes in here knowing, with the advice of Treasury and his senior economist, knowing that our package does in fact look after those uh, who are needy in our society, and he has the gall to say exactly the opposite. And I think he ought to be hauled before the court of public opinion and declared guilty for that constant misrepresentation. He says, of course they will claim it in wages. And I say that's for misrepresentation as well. And I've got quotes, as long as your arm, of him saying exactly the opposite back in 1985. And there is not one, to my knowledge, reputable economist in the country who would really do otherwise than accept a simple proposition, which is based on international experience 
and secondly, subject to having a sensible package, which we do, then inflation is not a problem. A GST is not, inflation, is not inherently inflationary, and that is well known, uh, well known amongst those who have studied this issue or have seen its, its application internationally. Then he goes on to say, number 23, we are about preserving low inflation. Well, I've dealt that with, with that one. It reminds me of we're bringing home the bacon. We hear it every year from this bloke. In 1987, he said this is the, the golden age of economic change. In 88, he's bringing home the bacon. In 1990, he had a ripper. He said, I won't let there be a recession. And then when we got one, he said, we had to have one in the first place. And then after that, he said, well, I knew we had to have one, but I didn't want to tell you that we had to have one. And tonight he'll say, don't worry, it's all going to be well. You vote for me, you support me, the recovery will be with us now. And that is simply not the truth. The truth is for this country that we have a lot to do by way of fundamental reforms to our economy. And sure, the economists are brought into the debate about what ought to be done. But quite frankly, most of the things that have to be done to improve our economic circumstances are obvious. And most of them are common sense. And most, in most cases, many of our competitors have made the changes which we now propose many years ago. And I suppose there are two symbols of our problem which strike me as important as any. One is our massive debt to the rest of the world, and it's $133 billion. And no one should have any doubts about the gravity of our circumstances. It's gone from $23 billion under Mr Recession to $133 billion today, order, and we are going to order, have to face— The de Deputy Leader of the Opposition will refer to members by their title. Oh. 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 Order, order, the, and the, the, sec the, the second order, the oh, Well, I take your point. Thank you. The second, si the second symbol is the number of unemployed in our community, and it is around one million people unemployed and nearly one-third of our young people. And we could do something about that. If you stopped your silly political games and misrepresentations and honestly referred to the issues and honestly attempted to change them, one, you'd have our support, and secondly, we could say to the young people of Australia, there is hope, there is a chance, there is opportunity in the future of this country if you support the changes which we recommend. Misrepresentation and the dishonesty that we've seen exhibited in this House yesterday a dishonesty which we are now used to in this place is no answer and does no Order, justice the to the unemployed. Yeah. 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 The Honourable the Treasurer. Mr. Mr Speaker, I guess the most uh, interesting revelation from this particular debate is the gross sensitivity of the opposition to any criticism. They, will, they are the ones, of course, who promised to have a sensible debate about political alternatives, about economic alternatives in this country, but at the slightest suggestion of criticism, not just from us, at the slightest suggestion of criticism from anybody, they don't, in fact, argue the point. They don't argue the point. They attack their critics. They demean their critics. They question the motives of their critics. And that is what we have seen here today. What we have seen in the two speeches, I suppose two of the most paltry speeches which have ever been associated with a censure motion in this House, because a censure motion is a very serious device used uh, by an opposition about very serious matters and usually, usually supported, accompanied by serious-minded speeches which actually go to the point of the political debate. But what, in fact, was this censure motion about? This censure motion was actually about the fact that the Prime Minister had uh, grasped some criticism, some criticism of the opposition's package, criticism which actually came from some of those who were associated with its, uh, with, uh, with its, with its uh, description and uh, those which were responsible for looking at its effects on the economy, he picked up on some of the results of this work and revealed to uh, perhaps a surprised nation that the actual effect of a switch from income tax to consumption tax would actually have a depressing effect on GDP, a depressing effect on employment and an escalating effect on unemployment. 
Now, having made that simple point, the opposition comes in here, uses one of the most serious devices, and then supports it with two of the worst speeches I have ever heard associated with a censure motion. I've heard one or, or two censures. Member for Kuyong will cease interjecting. I've heard order. one or I warn the member for Kuyong. I've heard one or two censure motions. I've even heard a couple from the honourable member for Kuyong. But at least, at least, at least the honourable member for Kuyong had had the decency to actually put a bit of substance into these speeches, and I might say, put a bit of put a bit of flair. I might say they were mainly composed of flair and only slightly composed of substance, but, never, but nevertheless he made an effort. He understood what a censure motion was. He understood that there was a tra tradition to be followed, and uh, of course he knew something about it. But of course uh, this, this political apprentice who now leads the, uh, leads the coalition, the one, uh, the one who the other day lamented, lamented on the Laws show, he said, I think there is far too much politics in the political system. <laughs> he said there's far too much politics in the political system. And what he wanted was a bit more leadership, whatever that might represent. But what he displayed here today was the antithesis of leadership. Because if you want to be a leader, if you want to set yourself up as the author of an alternative package, you've got to be prepared to support it. You've got to be prepared to argue the point and more particularly, you've got to be prepared to take a bit of criticism. But what have we seen as he has been parading himself around the country for the last few months? Every time someone offers any criticism of him, whenever anyone offers some support of us, they are abused for being either ignorant, for being self-serving, for being short-sighted. In other words, if anyone doesn't automatically and immediately accept the brilliance of his particular proposal, then, of course, they are not worthy of participation in any political debate. He has become a total monomaniac. He is totally obsessed with his own particular proposal and will have no truck with any criticism whatsoever. I just say to the Leader of the Opposition, I just say this, it is just it is just conceivable it is just conceivable that some of the criticisms are valid it is just conceivable that some of the support for the government's proposals have some validity it is just conceivable that what he is saying is wrong wrong i wonder if he can ever ever contemplate a circumstance where he could be considered to be wrong then uh, of course after his speech we had Humpty Dumpty from Flinders who came in here order, to offer. Order the Treasurer refer to the member oh, for his title. The, uh, the Honourable Member for Flinders, who, um, who, whose, whose sole contribution to this debate was to go through the Prime Minister's speech line by line. That was his sole contribution to this debate. No originality, just one of his staff had gone through the Prime Minister's speech and had sort of annotated it. So we got an annotated version of the Prime Minister's uh, answer to a question yesterday. That is, the, that is an, an, uh, an example of his originality. But in the process of his annotation of what I thought was a pretty uh, good answer from the Prime Minister, of course we got a string of just the kind of misrepresentations that he himself and the Leader of the Opposition were complaining about. For instance, he says, Whenever he looks around the world to see what has happened in the wake of the introduction of a consumption tax of the kind that they have been proposing, there hasn't been any inflation. Well, I can tell you, in those circumstances where there hasn't been any increase in inflation, it's because any inflationary pressures have been squeezed out of the economy by paralysingly high rates of interest. And that, of course, is what the opposition is really on about, and that is the point which they won't come clean about, that the one device that they have to achieve any purpose which they pretend they can achieve is a result of using high rates of interest in order to crush any tendency towards wage increases. And, of course, what happens when you have paralysingly high rates of interest 
is that you so depress the economy. The member for Pearce will cease interjecting. Is that you so depress the economy that you have uh, higher rates of unemployment? And of course, that is the point, the obvious point, which the opposition will simply not confront. Now, the uh, the um, the uh, deputy leader of the opposition went on to uh, quote. Uh, Dr Murphy, and I don't want to get into any particular argument with uh, Dr Murphy, but he did, say, he did say on the wireless that it was wrong for the Prime Minister to say that there had been a reduction in GDP of uh, 3 per cent. He said it should have been 7 per cent. He said what you've got to measure is not just the decline in GDP, as the Prime Minister referred to it, but also you've got to measure that from what GDP might have been had it not been for the recession. That is, had there been normal growth as opposed to the recession, what would the difference have been? And Dr Murphy said, well, the difference between the one and the other is 7 per cent. Well, if he's entitled to make that kind of observation, we're entitled to make another observation. And that is, if we look at the growth rates that applied during the period of the uh, Liberal Party uh, National Party coalition period, that of between 76-77 up to their ignominious defeat in 1983, and then you, where the rate of growth was 2.1 per cent, and then if you look at the rate of growth which occurred as a result of us, then we have added through our own efforts something like $50 billion to GDP. That is, GDP is now $50 billion higher than it would have been as a result of the continuation of the policies of uh, those opposite, including those policies which were uh, authored by the now Leader of the Opposition. So let's not—oh, well, if I'm drawing a long bow, how long is the bow that Dr Murphy is drawing in making his particular comparison? So, but, but of course the Deputy Leader of the Opposition probably wouldn't even have understood the point that was being made when he, uh, when he referred to his annotated version. But perhaps more interesting in terms of the opposition's attitude is its attitude to how we might now, not in three or four years' time, but their attitude now to how we might deal with Australia's current economic circumstances. Let's recall that over the last uh, year or so there have been 11 reductions in interest rates. And who is it? who has opposed every single one of those reductions. No prizes for guessing. The Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition has opposed every reduction in interest rates that has occurred over the last year or so. And now what is he saying? Now what is he saying when the proposition arises that maybe the government has the room to, in fact, apply a bit of fiscal stimulus to the economy? Not fiscal stimulus which is going to be applied in a cavalier or capricious way, but a stimulus which is going to be applied in a sensible way, in a way which will in fact underpin sustainable growth, not, uh, not, simply, not simply exploit an opportunity capriciously. He says, oh, of course you can't do that unless you fund it. He's got this notion of a funded stimulus. A funded stimulus. Oh, you can, you, can, you can spend a bit of money on job creation or on something else or on infrastructure so long as you save it somewhere else. Well, this is a very quaint observation about the way in which the budget operates. Of course, there are some circumstances in which you could switch some form of expenditure from one side, uh, to, from one activity to another, but the opportunities for that are very limited and certainly not immediate. So what you are saying is actually contradictory. You can't have a funded fiscal stimulus in the circumstances in which we are now contemplating it. And when, of course, we get support from this notion, support from the Macquarie Bank, support from the ANZ, support from uh, support from BT, support from various business uh, figures around the country, he says, oh, they're just self-serving. They're just interested in getting some handout from the government. They're just interested in looking after themselves. No suggestion that these people might have the national interest at heart. No suggestion 
that these people might actually be interested in the government doing something about providing jobs for the eight or 900,000 people who currently don't have them and want them. No, of course not. Of course, anyone who suggests anything other than the Leader of the Opposition has to be either ignorant or self-serving or have some other base motive. What you've got to look for in terms of what the Opposition Leader is really on about is what his view of the next ten years is really about. And uh, he made, I think, a very rambling speech, a speech which uh, I wouldn't imagine that uh, anyone delivering it would be very proud of, but nevertheless a speech he made in Perth uh, in January of this year. And he said that uh, he said in this uh, speech, and I just quote a couple of lines from it, he said there are a lot of pressures, there are a lot of uncertainties, he's talking about the world. There is now a lot of volatility and instability in the world economy, and that severely constrains what a small trading nation like Australia can hope to do in the course of this decade. And to find out what he really means by that, he goes on a little later and he says, we have been there for a much longer period of recessed activity in Australia. No, sorry. We have been there for, for a couple of years now, and the world economy is growing only slowly. So it will mean a much longer period of recessed activity in Australia, much more economic hardship and much more adjustments to be made. In other words, what the opposition leader is actually promising for Australia is a decade of austerity, a decade of hardship, a decade of high unemployment, a decade of nearly no growth. Or, so that is what the leader of the opposition is really about. He has been going round Australia like uh, some half-hearted sad sack, talking down Australia, talking down our economic prospects, simply because he doesn't want them to improve. It doesn't suit him. It doesn't suit him for the, our economic prospects to improve. It's about time he started to uh, discover some of the inherent strengths of uh, Australia, some of the inherent strengths of the Australian people, some of the great successes that we have already had, despite our current difficulties, some of the great advances Australia has made in the world and even in the, in the region. And it's about time he started showing a bit of respect for the efforts that, have Austra that Australian working men and women have put in, a bit of respect for the efforts that Australian management have put in over the last few years in order to make this a more robust economy, an economy which can now contemplate the prospect of more vigorous growth and, more importantly, sustainable growth and better standards of living for the Australian people. Order. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Leader of the National Party. Speaker, the, the Treasurer has laboured under the fact that he indeed was, uh, unbeknownst to most Australians, kicked out of the Keating Kitchen Cabinet in uh, the month of January. He's had little to do with the formation of the economic statement. He's in the outer ring and will watch with interest the contents of that statement tonight. And I want to pick up two particular things the Treasurer has said. He likes to hark back, as does the Prime Minister, to the performance of the Fraser coalition government Order. and the fact that uh, that uh, period of 82-83 was dominated by a recession. Now I can see 82-83 was a Order. major recession, but it's about time the government realised that during that period there was an all-time record drought in many parts of Australia, a drought far exceeding the current drought, bad as it is in many parts of Australia. And it's high time that if you are going to make those comparisons, you allow for the truth of the matter that the drought of 1982 was devastating for Australian rural production, Australian export income, and impacted on the recession when the member for Bennelong was the treasurer of this country. And to argue otherwise is a total falsehood. But in terms of that situation, I have to highlight to the House in many parts of Australia, right this day, the current drought continues and the government ought to be more aware of that as it prepares its policies and its economic statement tonight. Yeah. The second aspect of the Treasurer's comments related to a certain sensitivity. Well, I say the reality of this matter is that never has a Prime Minister been caught out so badly as this Prime Minister Keating was yesterday with his misquoting of the Murphy paper. We exposed it. We have dealt a body blow to the Prime Minister and he 
has done little in the defence of that today. Truth in the matter, truth in the matter is the Prime Minister made the mistake of partially quoting from a clipping without reading the underlying paper, which was available to him, and which, even when he did try to read the underlying paper today, he still got it wrong as the Leader of the Opposition and as the Deputy Leader of the Opposition so conclusively showed. But let me point out further, Mr Deputy Speaker, that indeed, in terms of uh, the Murphy paper, perhaps the ultimate umpire, quite properly, should be Mr Murphy himself. He knows what he wrote in the paper. He knows what he meant in the paper. And so what did Mr Murphy say last night by, by way of careful, formal statement? And I'll read to the House. And I quote, as an independent economic consultancy, Access Economics shies away from direct involvement in political debate. However, on this occasion, it has been necessary to correct a significant misrepresentation of the results of our analysis. That's what Murphy, the ultimate umpire on this matter, has said with regard to the Prime Minister's comments. And again this morning on the uh, program AM, so we can know exactly what the author of the paper said about the Prime Minister's comments, an independent economist working for Access Economics, when he said, uh, the interviewer, the ABC interviewer said, so we're looking at gains and losses of less than half a per cent, as opposed to the four per cent quoted by Paul Keating. Mr Murphy, that's right and definitely a long-term gain. So the ABC uh, reporter went on to say, how could have he got that number so wrong? The Prime Minister got that number so wrong. And indeed, he went on to say, so you're suggesting the Prime Minister was inaccurate or at least not presenting things as you believe they should be presented on both counts. Mr Murphy, I'd have to agree with that yes. So there is the ultimate answer. There's the Murphy answer to the treatment of uh, the Prime Minister's attack yesterday. And the truth of the matter is the Prime Minister was caught out badly indeed. His 20 years of experience in this parliament counted for nothing in terms of his preparation for yesterday and his performance for yesterday. But what annoys me more, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that the Prime Minister today had the height to say that we had been casting some vicious slurs, some very vicious slurs from the coalition. Well, I say to this Prime Minister that's nothing compared to the slur that he cast in the Great Hall last Monday morning in one of the most shabby speeches of welcome to the Queen of Australia ever given, for which he should hang his head in shame. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's nothing to the slur, it's nothing to the vicious slur cast by Prime Minister Paul Keating on the national flag of this country in the comments he made last month. But it's nothing it's nothing to the slur. It's nothing to the slur cast by this Prime Minister, not only on the coalition, but on every Australian exporter trying to do business in Asia when Prime Minister Paul Keating decided to introduce Asian racism into the immigration debate at a time when Australia does not need that shabby treatment of that very important subject. The Prime Minister should apologise on each and every count. Well, I might add, if the Prime Minister wants to debate Asian credentials, the Leader of the Opposition, myself and many of my uh, front bench colleagues, have spent a great deal more time in Asia doing it the hard way, out and about, and looking at uh, the economic developments, the export links and the like than ever, than ever Paul Keating did as Treasurer, and let alone is likely to do in the brief time period that he's Prime Minister. But let's turn to the fundamental situation with regard to the fight back package and the criticisms of the Prime Minister and the Murphy reduction in the GDP. And let's, Mr Deputy Speaker, look at some practical dimensions of the fight back package. This government sits there laughing and bragging when they know in their hearts that payroll tax is a direct tax on employment, but payroll tax does not exist in most Asian economic tigers, which have six, seven, eight, nine per cent growth and full employment at this time of world recession. And the payroll tax 
is ripping the heart out of many businesses struggling to survive and struggling to maintain jobs right around Australia. So it is. Look at uh, Amy. Look at the figures from the Australian Mining Industry Council. $3,000 average on every single mining industry employee goes in payroll tax. Look at uh, the Duncan Herons Creek uh, timber mill battling away to provide jobs on the north coast where unemployment is a real problem. Not that the member for Page or Richmond would uh, fully realise that. This year, for well, this last year, 1991, payroll tax, payroll tax payments, $88,845. Oh, a small item. They rubbish that. They're quite happy to stand up and defend the slug of payroll tax on the timber industry of the North Coast. Order. They Mindy should hang right. their heads in shame. We will abolish payroll tax. We will abolish completely payroll tax under fight back, and we will create jobs and provide hope and vision for Australia. Order. Then, Member for Page. People may not realise, on a practical note, on a practical note that uh, payroll tax even gets down to affecting, as the member for Dawson points out, vegetable farmers. $60,000 for a Bowen tomato grower. He has to meet in payroll tax before he can employ anybody else. A time when we're trying to create jobs, you have this huge slug of payroll tax. Who has had the courage to come back with a fight back package which stands up, which will boost employment, which will remove all payroll tax, all sales tax, all fuel excise tax and give this country some hope and particularly decentralised industries in this hope. Because what this, parliament, what this parliament should really be focusing on is the fact that there is a million people unemployed. It is the fact that youth unemployment is over 30 per cent in many places of Australia. It is the fact that there are community kitchens, soup kitchens, four of them operating in Albury, Wodonga in the 1990s, 60 years after the Great Depression, as a direct consequence of the policies of Prime Minister Paul Keating for the eight years that he was Treasurer of this country. Member for what, we have done, what we have done is produced a real alternative, an alternative that stacks up, that takes the radical reforming decisions, the fundamental framework decisions, in sharp contrast to the tinkering on the Titanic that we will get tonight in the economic statement. Now, I notice the member for Kennedy has made the mistake of buying into this debate. Well, let's read the, the, what the member for Kennedy had to say about the Prime Minister just a few short weeks ago. And I quote exactly, Keating is unacceptable. Does the member for Kennedy stand by that particular statement when we get the vote on this motion? And while I'm at it, Senator Margaret Reynolds. Senator Margaret Reynolds, you cannot give Keating away. And while I'm at it, Senator Jim McKernan, there are 900,000 reasons why Keating should not be Prime Minister. Have you forgotten that particular statement? And then we had the member for Reid, not game enough to be in the House just at this moment. The Labor Party is headed for a monumental, catastrophic defeat of unsworth proportions under Keating. But let's uh, end by the quote of John Scott. A member for Hindmarsh, which I think this is the first opportunity we have had to put this quote in Hansard. It is part of the Australian political history. It will be enshrined in Australian political history. You will recall that the member for Hindmarsh came racing out of that caucus meeting and said, and I quote, we have just elected the drover's dog, Keating, who will lead us to inglorious defeat at the next election. Yeah. Well, amen to that, and he's exactly right. And it's only eclipsed by John Garlow, a member for Leichhardt, I should hasten to add, Mr Deputy Speaker, who said Keating should stay away from Cairns as he is very unpopular. <laughs> so let's, let's have some of the uh, truth. Of course, those quotes all manifest why the Prime Minister should be censured this day. On the fundamentals, as moved by the Leader of the Opposition, the Prime Minister came into this House yesterday and misquoted Murphy and misquoted Murphy and did it in a deliberate, provocative way because he only knows one course. He doesn't know fundamental decision making, fundamental policy reform, or getting it right, or getting out of the cocoon of Canberra and the boardrooms of the capital cities and the big union meetings and listening to what people have to say. He only knows 
the battle of the one-liner. He only knows the rhetoric, the battle utilising rhetoric to come into the House and not address the fundamentals of this debate. Well, we have caught him out. We have exposed, we have exposed his total misrepresentation of the Murphy paper, and he will answer for it today and tomorrow and every day from now until the next federal elections. But let me say one other thing with regard to the misquotes used by the Prime Minister. Yesterday, the Prime Minister mounted the lie that it's going to be 15 per cent cost on this and 15 per cent cost on uh, food, clothing, soap and a range of other items. You are wrong. You are totally wrong. You are perpetrating a lie and you know it. And it's about um, time you corrected the, uh, your the rhetoric on this order, particular order. matter. The, the leader of the National Party should withdraw. I will draw the withdraw. statement lie and put you are perpetrating a total uh, mistruth, which or, order. ignores the honourable minister will assist the uh, which ignores the freight silence. savings, the huge freight savings. Quite apart from every other factor, the abolition of sales tax, the abolition of payroll tax, the abolition of fuel excise tax, the abolition of the one percent training levy. The abolition of uh, the coal export duty, which you thought was so good, you've even copied that particular and stolen that particular plank from the fight back package. But we're here on the great line that rail is going to get a run tonight, and in many ways, perhaps that's overdue if it's properly funded. But I want to just point out what you're not going to do tonight on rail. Are you going to abolish the diesel fuel excise, which costs Australian National $22 million a year, which costs State Rail New South Wales $48 million a year? which costs Queensland Rail $24 million a year, which costs V-Line $18 million a year, and as accurately pointed out by David Hawker, the member for Wannan, on top of that, the payroll tax paid by our rail system, you have $130 million of diesel fuel excise, $128 million of payroll tax paid by our rail systems, so they start each financial year $260 million behind the eight ball, whatever you do and decide to do in respect of rail tonight. So let's see that in its proper context. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, I say to the House that uh, the Prime Minister has failed in his first real test on the floor of this House. I say to the House that he would deliberately misquoted the Murphy papers, and the ultimate umpire on this, Mr Murphy himself, has confirmed the case of the coalition. And for those reasons, the Prime Minister deserves the full censure of this House. The question is, motion be agreed to. The honourable the leader of the house, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, as Deputy Speaker, uh, this is an extraordinary censure debate. I don't think I've uh, been in the house where a censure motion has been so lacking in substance, but so redolent of a previous life of mine. I wondered where I'd heard all these sorts of uh, debates before, and I recognised what this represents is the sorts of touchiness that you find in the academic community when somebody's quoted somebody against someone else they immediately have one of these terribly prissy debates in the common room so what poor old tim fisher or the leader of the national party and the member for flinders who have not suffered under these sorts of propositions in the past have suddenly been invited to do is to march their way into the common room of the economics department of the university of sydney by a would be prime minister well all I can say to that is the appropriate place for that sort of debate to be conducted is in the economics department at uh, Sydney University, and the sooner the leader of the opposition returns there, the sooner he will find himself in a position more appropriate to his character, and not placing himself in charge of the affairs of this nation, where he will treat the people of this country as an experimentation for a paper, a bit of basic data for what he intends to produce about what a country can look like after you have done something to them. Now, I must say one of my colleagues uh, who has uh, had the uh, opportunity to attend that particular uh, conference at which, uh, at which Mr Murphy spoke, uh, he, Mr. Murphy, Dr Murphy got up and said one or two things about worst case scenarios uh, and then decided that uh, it would only occur if there was a wage blowout. The sort of problem that we have referred to would occur if there was a wage blowout. At the conference, Murphy was asked, what if the wage blowout did look as if it was likely? Now, that's the most likely, in fact, outcome of the implementation of this set of propositions. Inevitable. What if it was likely? And the answer was, he said, in that case, you probably shouldn't pursue the tax mix shift. Well, heck, I mean, what, a, 
What, what an experimentation to impose on the people of this country. What a, an academic experiment to treat us all as a test tube. There's another element to the Leader of the Opposition's positions on all of these matters that go to the very narrowness of the base from which he seeks to govern this nation, and that is his attitude on the question of consultation. He has been knocked not so much by the fact that the government talks to business. I know the Prime Minister yesterday made points about that. The government talks to business. The fact that the Leader of the Opposition had taken umbrage about the fact that government talks to business, but about the fact that the government talks to anyone at all. The position of the Opposition has been, in persistent criticism of this government, if you talk to Greens, if you talk to people in Social Security, if you talk to people in business, if in fact you consult just about anybody, it can only presage a deal, that you will come to a conclusion different from what you might have other been, uh, otherwise come to if you had an alternative piece of information presented before you. Now, if anything represents more the danger of the Leader of the Opposition ever becoming Prime Minister of this country is the utter obsession that he has with doing things by himself and not consulting his colleagues. What his colleagues are finding out about the goods and services tax package at the moment, and they'll find out more about it as they go through the year, is that the sorts of things that would be corrected, the sorts of questions that would be asked by a process of open consultation with a broad-ranging group of people were not asked. Nobody in the opposition knew Murphy's estimates when they marched this paper into the, into the opposition room. What would have happened? If somebody had actually stood up in the opposition room and said, now listen, the estimates of the econometrician who has modelled these sorts of outcomes, particularly if there's a wage increase, there will be no growth for five years and that unemployment will actually rise. Uh, Mr Leader, that's a, a pretty well-founded estimate. What have you got to say about that and what corrections have you put in place? If there had been consultation, somebody might have picked that up, but there wasn't. There was a gaggle of clackers, some of whom opposed, not, clack, not the clacker, there were one or two non clackers, some of whom, on the basis of about a 48 hour reading of this paper, had an opportunity basically to raise a few points of objection in principle and were, of course, overwhelmed, but none on the other side of the House, let alone anyone out there in the community, had an opportunity to put anything before the Leader of the Opposition when he did this package. And having done the package, what he said is we will not budge off an inch of it. That is an impossible way to govern the country, an utterly impossible way to govern the country, and it fundamentally lacks a democratic consciousness. That's all there is to it. It fundamentally lacks a capacity to understand that the community does not vote for Führers. The community does not, out there, uh, vote and simply abandon its brains and abandon its attitudes and abandon its intelligence. The community in a democracy is in part of an ongoing process of, of, of discussion with government on policy issues, and it expects to be capable of modifying government opinion while that proceeds. Now, when uh, the Leader of the Opposition brought this down, he was fortunate to have handed to him the collective brains of the Liberal Party front bench and back bench. They walked away from the intelligence God gave them and, uh, and, persist and, and handed that over as hostage to the Leader of the Opposition for the next, uh, the next uh, 15 to 18 months. And they have to, as a result of that, eschew from their minds any conceivable alternative proposition. The real danger in what the, in what the Prime Minister did to the Leader of the uh, Opposition yesterday was that he presented to not so much the public generally. The public generally, in fact, does not listen to question time. What he presented to the, to the opposition backbench was a scenario by which he said to them, you had better recover your intelligence. You had better call back your brains from escrow and see if you cannot sit down with your leader of the opposition and attach to some of these things that he, is, uh, that he has been doing a bit of sensible criticism. It, otherwise, there, there have to be explanations for some of the, some of the most extraordinary elements of the opposition's leader's performance, and this is, I think, as good an explanation as any for it. 
because I can't believe, even though we taunt him on this side of the house, that he has a glass jaw, I cannot believe that the, gore, the jaw is that brittle, that brittle, that one going over in a question time causes him to want to eliminate another question time, uh, not, not confront that question time, uh, but to, for the purposes of his back bench, try to prove some academic point on the Prime Minister. I cannot believe that he is that brittle, because if he is that brittle, then the personality that we may well have imposed on us if he's uh, uh, unfortunately successful in winning the election is a very, very dangerous personality indeed. Fortunately, we'll have about 15 months for the public to find out what we have managed to find out in this place in very short order indeed. Now, it is not as though there aren't goods and services taxes elsewhere in the world, and it's not as though there are a few people who haven't had an opinion on them from time to time. One of the opinions on uh, goods and services tax was handed to me by uh, the, uh, the government's minister for uh, small business, and it's a study by the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, produced uh, last year. The response to the survey from CFIB members was nothing short of astounding. This is going through the executive summary. Fully 25,362 responses to the survey were received, the strongest response the CFIB has ever received to a national survey. And this is what business said. People are supposed to be benefiting you know, from the payroll tax deduction. The findings of the survey indicate that 70.6 per cent of respondents found that the GST had a negative impact on their business, with 8 per cent believing that the impact to be positive, while 14.4 per cent found no impact. Results clearly illustrate the regressive effect of taxes like GST, as smallest firms had most problems with the tax. As to why the GST impact has been so negative, cost increases as a result of the tax was the number one reason, followed closely by a decline in sales attributed to the GST. Now, the simple fact of the matter is this. The opposition leader, or leader of the National Party can stand up in this place and talk about what may or may not happen to payroll tax, which is not imposed on the majority of businesses right. in this country. <laughs> well, he may or may not say that, but what he cannot conceal is this, that the fundamental premise of the opposition's position is that there will be a goods and services tax virtually on everything at 15 per cent, paid for effectively by the ordinary taxpayer, or paid effectively by the ordinary taxpayer, and administered by the small business and businesses of this country, administered by the business of this country, in return, in return there will be massive tax cuts for upper income earners and a removal of payroll tax on big business. That is what, that is what will be exchanged. For all the people sitting up there in the gallery, you will have the inevitable privilege of spending, of, 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 uh, of paying a 15 per cent tax on everything you buy paying a 15 per cent tax on everything you buy in order to remove payroll tax not from small business but from big business and you will impose and to ensure that what is imposed on uh, what is imposed on business what is imposed on small business then is an utter administrative nightmare now when you see propositions like that when you see propositions like that you begin to see why dr murphy might come out with the propositions that he has in the past, when people have debated goods and services tax, nobody has actually seriously got up and debated goods and services tax as the way to productivity. Goods and services tax, VATs, were introduced basically in Europe because governments found them more easy to raise than increasing income taxes and that when they are supporting a very much larger state than we support here, or B, because they have to supply subsidies for the farming population of the European Economic Community. Well, that's why they introduce them. That's what VATs go to. Nobody has actually introduced a VAT in Europe because somebody's come along and said, I've got a really beaut idea to improve productivity and equity in this community. Let's have a goods and services tax. They've put it on them because they've never taken fiscal discipline upon themselves or they have to pay for the rots of the European agricultural system. But even then, they have a bit of decency in them. <clears throat> because when I, I was recently entertained a British Labor Party colleague who came out here, and his surprise was to discover that the VAT being imposed, or the goods and services tax sought to be imposed by the opposition, was actually being imposed on food, on babies' clothes, 
on, uh, on, the, uh, on, on vegetables, on school uniforms, on all these sorts of things, all of which are exempt in the United Kingdom. You don't actually pay goods and services tax on that. And indeed, when Maggie Thatcher was invited to, uh, to extend the goods and services tax to incorporate those things, Maggie Thatcher was invited to extend the goods and services tax. She said, oh, no. I mean, this is a, these are the necessities of life of people. I don't do that sort of thing. So uh, that's, the, uh, that's the position that she, she found herself in when, uh, when she came to doing that. Now, the opposition leader has also had something to say about what we intend to do tonight. And what he has had to say about it is that basically he alone, amongst just about every conceivable economic commentator, by one or two, has said that there is no room for any fiscal stimulus. He has said that if you're going to do some spending, you've got to pay for it. Well, fine, Dr Hewson, on your own criteria, there are one or two other things that Dr Murphy did not mention about your goods and services tax, but about which we need to know a few answers. And that is, where Treasury and Finance have identified a $4 billion gap in your figuring, how do you intend to close it? Not us. Well, I think if we sat down and really worked our way through this politically, we could find a bit, fair bit bigger than a $4 billion gap. Where Treasury and Finance, if you were elected to government, what would happen next week? You'd put your policies before the uh, Treasury and Finance uh, departments and you'd say, give us cost estimates of these. They would come back and say, yes, Prime Minister Hewson, we have done cost estimates of these. You're $4 billion out. You're going to have to adjust policy. That's what they'd have to say to that. But we have not heard one word, as far as the opposition is concerned, we have not heard one word from them on the, uh, on the subject of how they'd make up that $4 billion shortfall or whether they'd just simply cop it. Because if they're just going to simply cop it, what a, what a pounding, thundering bunch of hip, uh, amount of hypocrisy it is that they have imposed on us in the sort of uh, nonsensical censure motion that they've put up here today. This censure motion is as near as a censure motion gets in this place to being a joke. It is a, it is a running away. It is a running away from question time. It is a running away from serious issues to attempt to, attempt to turn this house into the common room of an economics department in a university. Now, that sort of ridiculousness must be resisted by this House in defence of its own dignity, and to give the House the opportunity to do that, I move the motion be put. Order. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Order. The member for Dundas will resume his seat. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. There's too much noise in the chamber.
Lock the doors. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I appoint the honourable members for Canning and Fowler, tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Riverina, Darling and Wakefield, tell us for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 70, noes 65. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the censure motion be agreed to. All those with that opinion, please say aye. aye. Those against, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the censure motion be agreed to. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Riverina, Darling and Wakefield tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Canning and Fowler tell us for the nose. I'm not a question, you know, son. Order. The result of the division is ayes 64, noes 71. The division is therefore resolved in the negative. Would honourable members please resume their seats?
Order. I, will honourable members please resume their seats? Order. Will honourable members resume their seats? Or are there any further questions, the honourable the prime minister? On the notice paper, please. The order. Order.